Deirdre McCluskey is a distinguished professor emerita of economics and of history at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She has written, I think, 20 books. Uh, 25, I, I, actually. 25, okay. <laughs> and around 400 or many more scholarly pieces. I think they About stopped counting at some point right. on topics ranging from statistical theory to transgender advocacy and the ethics of bourgeois virtues. Mm -hmm. In recent years, she has won a number of awards, including the Hayek Lifetime Achievement Award, the Adam Smith Prize, and the Hayek Book Prize. Uh, it's hard to keep track of the books, but from, from uh, just looking at Amazon, the last few books, uh, Bettering Humanomics, and we'll talk a yep. little bit about what she means by humanomics, and you and Old Approach to Economic Science, which just came out this year, so yep. uh, just went up. Uh, Leave me alone and I'll make you rich. How the bourgeois <laughs> deal enriched the world. And uh, that was co-authored with Art Coggin. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Why Liberalism Works, How True Liberal Values Produce a Freer, More Equal, Prosperous World for All uh, in 2019. And then, of course, the, the, the three books that I think have been uh, unbelievably influential in, uh, in many fields, uh, not just economics, uh, the Bourgeois Trilogy, uh, the bourgeois virtues, the bourgeois dignity, bourgeois equality, uh, how ideas, not capital institutions, enrich the world. And, and we're really, I think, going to talk today primarily about the trilogy, uh, but, yeah. but touch on some of the other topics as well. Uh, so thank you. Thanks, uh, Deirdre, for joining me. It's, uh, you know, we, we seem to bump into each other in all kinds of places around the world. I think last time I saw you was in Serbia or somewhere yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, Scotland as well. We were in Scotland together. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's all over the world. Uh, so it's and and now on Zoom because we can't. We haven't been able yeah, to. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, true. the next time we meet, it'll be somewhere. Uh, I in hope the so. COVID world, world. So let's start with this idea of of the great enrichment. Um, what what is it? What do you mean by great enrichment? And and give us a little bit of a sense of 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 how significant it is in terms of human history? Well, it's it, the, the standard world word is the industrial revolution, or then a very boring phrase, um, modern economic growth. And neither of them is quite adequate to the task because it's so big. <laughs> it's really astonishing. The average person in the world bumped along for millennia on two or on the on the modern equivalent of two or three dollars a day. Now imagine trying to live in San Juan or 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 in New York on two or three dollars a day. You know, okay. So then around 1800, not not obviously in that very year, but around 1800, or if you like symbolic dates, around 1776, there was this explosion of creativity, of human creativity. It's not about capital accumulation. Mm -hmm. As good, as important as I think of financial institutions and capital accumulation are, they're not causal. That is, it's, it's ideas for, I don't know, a steam engine or something. That's what's causal in human history. And what's extraordinary is that after 1800 and then continuing, that's what's remarkable about it. It doesn't just start out, but it keeps going, chug, 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 chug. At about, in, in countries like the United States or Britain at about 2% per year per capita. Um, and in a couple hundred years, that's meant that the average Britain <clears throat> or the average Japanese person is earning in the same terms. Now, you remember two or three dollars a day, over a hundred dollars a day, mm -hmm. well over a hundred per day, yep. every man, woman, and child on average. Well, you know, you can't, that needs to be called great yep. because nothing like it had ever come even close to happening. There were efflorence, efflorescences, as Jack Goldstone calls them quite appropriately before, you know, uh, the Italian Renaissance resulted in a lot of economic growth, but, but then it went, went down again. And the good emperors in the Roman Empire, maybe it doubled, 
but we're not talking about doubling. We're talking about 3,000%. So it's an enrichment and it's great. And it appears to be by now, after a couple of centuries, unstoppable. And it and it's 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 understating it in a sense to even say three hundred thousand yeah. percent, because how do you how do you put a dollar amount on running water and and uh, so, and toilets right? <laughs> and, 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 and that's exactly right. I mean, if you could say, oh, well, there were doctors in eighteen hundred. Yeah, <laughs> there were doctors <laughs> who killed George Washington by bleeding him. Yeah. Okay, great. Now, now we actually have doctors after and for the last 100 years or so, doctors who actually don't kill you. And even education has improved. I mean, certainly in extent, but even in quality, the things you learn about chemistry or history are better than they were in 1800. And you can just go on and on and on like this. So, so yes, that's right. It's a it's it's a gross understatement. It's more like ten thousand percent, which is really hard to hold in your mind. Ten thousand percent? How can that be? Well, but it is. So, you know, when I uh, when I went to school, but even more so, I think today, that period, the nineteenth century, the Industrial Revolution, is always portrayed in negative terms. Yeah, you bet. Um, I mean, it's it's the emphasis is on child labor, the emphasis is on, yeah. on uh, pollution, on all yeah. the negative stuff that was that supposed yeah, to. You know. yeah. Why is it? Why, why do you think that is? And, well, and in what sense was is that portrayal wrong? Well, but that's why the phrase the Industrial Revolution, which has got all this uh, bad association, needs to be retired in a, in a wonderful spoof history of England called 1066 and all that. Back in 1931, the author spoke not of the Industrial Revolution, but the Industrial Revelation. Huh. They, they were making a joke. And they said, look, around 1800, all the rich men in England realized that women and children could work 25 hours a day without many of them dying or becoming excessively deformed. This was known as the Industrial Revolution. And it's a silly way of talking. It, it, people who think that Charles, Char, 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 Charles Dickens, for example, is an accurate portrayal of, uh, of the Industrial Revolution don't know much about the Industrial Revolution or Charles Dickens because he was a, a, a Southern Englishman. Um, he had been to the North once in oh. his entire life. <laughs> and and his and the poverty he was talking about was the traditional um, poverty of London, of the South. Um, uh, uh, Carlyle, to Thomas Carlyle, was another person that fastened this this the, this negative view of what was happening. Um, and he was a, he was a, a, a conservative, a kind of extreme conservative, who believed that the Middle Ages were just great. And that kind of Monty Python peasants <laughs> crawling around eating mud was really su such a great thing. No, it, it, it people moved to Lille and, and, and London and Boston from the countryside, even though all, all of those places were still until well into the 19th century. Um, uh, uh, very dangerous because of bad water from the health point of view, but they kept moving to them because the jobs were better. It was better to go to Manchester as an Irish uh, peasant and work in a mill than to stay in Ireland. It just was. And so what, what actually happened is an income started going up, uh, even in the face of rather sharp population increase in, in England, say. And by the late 18th, 19th century, their uh, the, the income is, is ticking up for ordinary people at, a, at, a, at, at, at quite a good rate. Now, the trouble is that that quite good rate didn't happen immediately and fast. It, it wasn't like the way it happened in Hong Kong after um, 
after 1948 or the way it happened in, uh, in Ireland for that matter in the last 40 years, it happened rather slower. And this allowed in the middle of the 19th century, this unfortunate turn against what we unfortunately call capitalism. And so it's all tied up to this, uh, I don't know, guilt. <laughs> I'm rich, I know that I'm rich. Gee, look, look around in my house, but oh God, I, I feel that I should feel guilty about those poor people. And the whole idea that there was a sacrifice to get rich, which is this deep conviction that humans have that the world is zero sum, that if I'm doing better, it must be because someone, imperialists or uh, Manchester factory owners or someone is extracting from poor people. Why do you think the mythology of the of that era? I mean, I you can somewhat understand, okay, Dickens never went north and and he had maybe an agenda at the time, but but we've had the benefit of a hundred and <laughs> some years to study and to know and to examine, and yet the mythology I know, I know it's stronger today maybe than back then. It's incredible. You're absolutely right. It is stronger actually than back then. Back then, people uh, were speaking of English people had a quite laissez-faire attitude about all this. There, there was factory le legislation that started to come in, but actually, the percentage of uh, of children in advanced industry it was falling in the 19th century, say in cotton mills, before yep. the be, before the government got into the business of trying to bring it even further down. Um, and so it, 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 it's the, as we know, there was a big change in ideology among educated people in rich countries in the last hundred years. Before the 1930s, the average American was again somewhat laissez-faire about industry, although having been stirred up by the uh, by the progressives like uh, Theodore Roosevelt had begun to, um, to feel that they, they should attack uh, um, people who are rich. But the, the um, and, and that I think plays into it because th then you, uh, in a way as, as, uh, as Nixon famously said, we're all Keynesians now. And, it, and that's actually true. We're all statists now. I have, a, I have a cousin who works for the CIA. We don't know quite what Annie does, but we think she she runs spies. <laughs> anyway, she's, she's very smart and uh, very able. And she, I, said, I was expositing this to her one day and said, oh, look, Annie, the, a modern economy doesn't need a lot of regulation. And she said, oh, no, that's wrong. The more complicated an economy is, the more regulation it needs. And that's a very strongly held presumption. You see it in, in the newspaper and on TV all the time. And I said, no, Annie, it's the opposite. It's <laughs> you can't run an economy with, you know, billions of people making trillions of decisions of their own every day. Uh, you, and, and there is such a thing as a spontaneous order and, as in language. And it's just crazy to try to regulate it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the market is such an amazing coordinating mm -hmm. uh, you know, mechanism. The price system yeah. is, is, is uh, yeah. many economists. And it's, it, we, we often compare it as economists with a computer, yeah. but yeah. That, that's a little bit shallow because it's not a computer, it's a questionnaire. Yep. It's an ongoing inquiry into what you want this afternoon for yeah. dinner. <laughs> what are your values? What are, you, what are your values right now today, dear? And then you go to the store and surprise, surprise, there's a nice loaf of French bread and a little ham. And, that and, and, and let are. me excite you about potentially new values that you don't even, you haven't even exactly. thought of. Oh, here, I have a, I have a, I have a friend who, uh, who works in marketing, and she tells me that every year in the United States, in some grocery store or other in the United States, I hear this, new, what she calls them, consumer packaged goods, so it's not raw 
vegetables or something, yep. but consumer packaged goods, new ones in the number of, now hear this, 40,000 are tried out. Wow. And of them, wow. you know, we all know, a few hundred yep. become standard items, but that's all. Yep. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. These and are no these central, busy. Yeah. No central planet could ever think yeah. of that, right? Absolutely not. They'd go nuts. They, well, they wouldn't. They wouldn't be. They'd be. They, they'd go and shoot themselves or. Or, or they limit us to one choice of toilet paper because who needs more yeah, than that's one? That's right. That's right. You need green raincoats. Period. <laughs> so you've spent a, a big part of the last uh, couple of decades really focused on the question of the causes of this great enrichment uh, yeah. and. So why do you think that's important? What relevance does that have for us today? Well, the, you know, look, um, it's not so much that history repeats itself, someone said, as it rhymes. And it's not quite that if we don't know history, we're condemned to repeat it. But it is true that if we keep screwing up the history and get these bad ideas about, you know, the industrial revolution and so on, we're going to hurt ourselves now in policy. We're not going to know what, what's the sensible thing to do. And I've discovered that most of the way economists and, uh, and other people think about how we got rich is wrong. Uh, my very dear friend, a great uh, economic historian Joel Mokir thinks that it's science with a capital S. And I, I, I like science. I'm not against science. Um, but I think that the scientific component of our enrichment is rather recent, max the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, transistors, they announced today, IBM announced that they can now do transistors that are about the size of a human DNA. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. And boy, that's wonderful. And that couldn't be done with handicraft or just smart inventors. But so I agree that there's a big scientific component of modern life, of recent life, put it that way. But there had been a massive increase in world income and, and in special parts like Britain and the United States, uh, quite massive by 1900 or 1920. So I don't think science is, is, the, is the, how can I say that the, the spark plug here or the spring, the spring in the mechanical watch, right? Yep. Um, and then people say, uh, all, my friends uh, on the right, you might say, or on the, uh, 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 on, on the libertarian side or liberal, they say investment. Well, yeah, you got to have investment. If you're going to make a, I don't know, a steam engine, you got to have some steel or iron or something. You got to make it. Can't just say, oh, gee, it'd be nice. I wonder about it. Have the idea of a steam engine, but not doing about it. But all kinds of things are necessary. Law and order is necessary. Yep. The absence of an act of civil war. Um, um, uh, the, uh, the, a labor force. Um, air. <laughs> Oxygen in the air. Um, sunshine. Uh, rain. The arrow of time. The existence of the universe. Sure. There are an infinite number of necessary conditions. But there was something peculiar about the world, especially Northwestern Europe in the late 18th and early 19th century. And that was an ideological change, a change in the attitude people had towards the economy. Now for millennia, the not unreasonable presumption was zero sum. Mm -hmm. If I'm poor, it's because that damn Lord of mine has extracted more from me. And I, it wasn't such a crazy idea. Yep. But in, in the late 18th, 18th century, this notion entirely new of liberalism, correctly defined, Adam Smith's um, obvious and simple system of natural 
uh, the, the, um, liberty, as mm -hmm. he said, started to ferment in the minds of advanced intellectuals like Voltaire and Mary Wollstonecraft and Smith and Tom Paine and so on and so forth. And um, that's what changed it is quite surprisingly. This idea of innovism, I'm sorry, of, of liberalism said, you know, all that stuff you've heard for since the beginning of time, at least the beginning of agriculture, that there's one class of people called lords and then there's, we're all a bunch of serfs or slaves. That's not true. All men and women, dear, are created equal. And that egalitarianism of, not of opportunity, that's not quite the right way to put it, but equality of permission. You're permitted to start a hedge fund. You're permitted to open a factory. You're permitted to try to make a hairdressing salon in the neighborhood work. You're, you're permitted to move to North Dakota to work on the oil fields. You're permitted, permitted, you're, 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 you're permitted to divorce your husband if he, if he beats you. You're permitted as a child not to obey your father into your adulthood. Mm -hmm. And on and on and on, you're, you're you're, you're, you're permitted not to be someone's actual slave. You're, all this liberation made, uh, very unsurprisingly, when you think about it, made people bold. Yep. Because they were being invited to have a go, as the English say. And go they did. And the result was an astonishing increase in innovations, not just mechanical, but biological, but also organization, the organization of, 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 of stock markets and of, of, of wholesale and, and, if, and forward markets. The, the organization of academic life was, it was an invention. 1810 in the University of Berlin uh, uh, by, by Humboldt, um, the com combining of teaching and research, which was not what previous universities were, they, yep. they were trade schools. So, and on and on it goes, the idea that, that women are equal is tremendously productive economically mm -hmm. um, um, and in all kinds of other ways, artistically, musically, and so forth. So it, there's this tremendous weight that's taken off humanity or be beginning, now look, come on, this stuff was slow. The United States, which, uh, you know, was famously free, well, not so free, we had, had slavery until 1865, but gradually this weight is lifted and people respond with tremendous innovation. Um, you've written on, on the, on the, the uh, well, well, what you call the, the, the Israeli test, that, that the, the, his, Israeli society is unusually innovative for such a tiny little place because precisely because of this kind of thing. Israelis <laughs> regard themselves all as equal. And, yep. if you, and if you don't think so, you get a lot of shouting at you on, on, the, on the buses. So, and, and that's true in, the, in these liberal countries in general. So there was this tremendous explosion. Now, one of the sort of linking ideas is you got liberalism, and then we, you could call the economic version of li liberalism innovism, mm -hmm. which is the word I much prefer to the very misleading word capitalism. capitalism. Yeah. So why do you prefer innovism to capitalism? Well, because, because go, go, go back to my statement that, that uh, my earlier statement that exploitation didn't cause the uh, great uh, enrichment, neither did um, science, neither did even capital. Mm -hmm. Some industries need a lot of capital. We, we sort of grew up thinking about this in the railway age and railways do require a lot of capital, but hey, there are uh, c consulting firms don't, <laughs> for example. Uh, and so although capital is often essential, 
So are a whole bunch of other things. It's yeah. not the necessary things. It's the sufficiency. It's so the spring and 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 uh, innovation is is the, the 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 proximate cause of our enrichment is innovation of all kinds, and the ultimate cause is this change in ideas of so so, so a much better way of characterizing the modern world is not capitalism. You might as well use laborism or climatism or existence of the worldism. No, those are all necessary, but not sufficient. Whereas innovism was sufficient, considering that we didn't have active civil wars and so forth. And, and what caused the innovism is this change of ideas to a exactly. commissionless society where people had the right to act on their own beliefs. And their own exactly. Beliefs. And, and, and as, your, as your word beliefs suggested, it was connected to the to 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 the Protestant Reformation, the wars of religion, and the final exhausted settlement by the 18th century of those wars. But it's not deep in European history. That's something I want to emphasize. Because there are all these theories, this, this weird hypothesis, W-E-I-R-D, um, uh, um, or, or Christianity causing um, enrichment, in which case, I, I don't know why very non-Christian Chinese are doing so well, but the, all this stuff about how, how and it, it, it all, I don't mean it always comes down to this, but it, behind it, there's often a presumption that we melanin challenged people are superior to you brown and black people. And that's bloody silly because we all came from Africa Yep. I mean, everyone here is African, let's face up to it. And uh, in fact, <laughs> genetic variability in Sub-Saharan Africa is much larger than it is anywhere else in the world. So when Sub-Saharan Africa joins the great enrichment, and I expect it to do over the next half century or so, and so Sub-Saharan Africans are educated as well as other people are. Yep. All those best math professors, um, <laughs> fiddlers, although the Ashkenazis will always be very good, uh, um, chess players, writers will be black. <laughs> That's my prediction. Forward to that day. I mean, it would be exciting to see Africa really <laughs> well, do it. Well, and it's gonna, I think it's going to happen. I think so, too. Look, I'm very optimistic. I, you can make up all kinds of pessimisms, and, and, and politicians love pessimistic thought. Absolutely. Because who's going to solve it but me? Yep. And <laughs> yep. that's very irritating. Um, uh, so yes, there's there, there's a uh, problem of um, of the environment, but we're not. It's not that we're not doing anything about it. We're we're doing it and getting advice, passionate advice, passionate advice about the environment from Swedish schoolgirls is <laughs> not, I think, a wise way to go. <laughs> so I, I'm uh, I'm optimistic about this, and there's no reason at all why this great enrichment can't spread to the rest of the world in the way it spread to China after 1978, when my friend Steve Chung convinced the Communist Party to move to a capitalist or, or a innovistic direction, and it's then it happened in India yep. from, after 1991. And of course, we got South Korea and Japan. And South Korea, Japan, and and I, I want to add in, as I did before, the, the example of Ireland. Yep. Which, when when I first went to Ireland in nineteen, when it was the uh, the summer of 1967, it was a third world country, priest ridden, you know, yep. people in black outfits all over the place, uh, um, poor, extremely poor, uh, a terrible society, and my ancestors. Mm -hmm. That's why my ancestors left. I went back there in 1996, and O'Connell Street was thronged with prosperous Irish people. 
Yeah, it's and it's it's amazing what they've done, and it's it's even more so today, in spite of all the f- problems. You have well, East Island has look, done phenomenally well, and it's they had a, they they had a big problem in two thousand and eight in Ireland and they in the in in uh, in housing. Yeah. <laughs> now Ireland, in some accounts, varies. Of course, this I think is the IMF ranking is the fifth highest per capita income in the world. Yeah, it's stunning. It's stunning. And it's all because of the same principles, same causes. Same principles. Well, as as we as our Cardin and I said, the we you, you adopt the bourgeois deal. Leave me alone and I'll make you rich. <laughs> and that's what they did. So one of the things, that, one of the ideas that you identify as having changed during this period is the attitude towards commerce, towards the bourgeois, sure. towards making money, towards wealth. And in the sure. example of Shakespeare versus Jane Austen, which I, which I love. Could you, could yeah, you, could you elaborate the, on that? look, Shakespeare was bourgeois, small bourgeois, but bourgeois. His father was a, a glove maker in Stratford. And he was trained in it, though he went to grammar school, which in the 16th century was the way forward for smart young boys. Mm-hmm. So he had, as uh, someone said after he died, small Latin and less Greek. But he had, he was kind of educated. Yep. Um, okay, he goes to London to be an actor and he finds that he's from sort of 1690 on. He, He's very good at at playwriting, and he becomes an entrepreneur. He owns the Globe, um, and he he runs an enterprise, namely, it's sort of like owning a movie house, right, in the old days. He runs it. One quarter of the population of London every week would go to the theater. That's how popular, I don't mean just Shakespeare, but all of them. That's how popular they were. That that was what what you did. You know, the groundlings paid a, a penny or something, and and the bourgeoisie were above, and the aristocracy on top, and that's how it worked. So he was a businessman. <laughs> Yet, in his plays, yep. there is no hero, a, admired hero, who is in business. Mm-hmm. You say, oh, well, Antonio in the Merchant of Venice. No. Antonio is a fool for love. Yep. It turns out he's in love with 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 with, with Bassanio. Bassanio is an impoverished aristocrat from whom <laughs> he gets a loan, a very ill-considered loan from eventually from uh, from uh, uh, from the Jew. Yeah, from Shylock. Shylock, you know, there were no Jews in England at the time. Yes, at the time, I know. It was not until Cromwell that they were allowed in again. And so people didn't know what a Jew was. They had no idea, but they knew that they were kind of good at at, at medicine and in in finance. Anyway, (laughs) so there's, and and in all the other plays, the heroes are either, uh, fairies, I mean, in, in the old sense, or they're aristocrats. Yep. Henry V, uh, mm-hmm. come on. By the time of Jane Austen, it's, it's happening all across the 18th century. She treats merchants and people in business with respect. Her, um, one of her, uh, uh, her, brothers became a banker in London. And she had friendly people, cousins and so on that she visited in London and Bath and so forth, who were in business. Mm-hmm. Now, it's her, her novels are not about the urban bourgeoisie. They're about the gentry. Um, they're not about the aristocracy and they're not about the urban middle class or the certainly not about the poor. They're about this rather large group in England of gentry who were the middle class, so to speak. That's not quite how to put it, but they were they were in the country. But so there in fact it's 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 of course tragic that she died young as she did. 
because she was starting to write after 1815 about the new commercially active Britain. And it would have been very interesting to see her develop that way. Of course, it seems like we've gone backwards, right? So today- Yeah, yeah that's right. That's good find a, a businessman who's a hero in a movie, can't find uh, a businessman or commerce. I mean, finance, they never mind finance. Oh, They're that's all what, the villains. But that's what's so crazy. Hollywood is filled yep. with corporate executives who approve movies attacking corporate executives. Now this this is crazy. This and, and the, but there are, there are a few exceptions in, in 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 the history of film. There have been some ups and downs in this, but as you point out, the general tendency is this anti in quotes capitalist um, talk, uh, like um, the la, 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 like the Wall Street movies, the two of them. But there there are a few exceptions. For example, Joy. A movie mm -hmm. about eight, eight years ago, about Joy Mangano, the inventor of the self-squeezing mop, yeah. or The Founder, yes, which was about Ray Kroc, mm -hmm. um, an unsuccessful businessman who finally figured out how to make McDonald's into um, yep. an enormous company. It's, it's very rare, though. That's why we remember. It's that. rare. It's, it's rare. To do I mean, it. look. There has been no movie about um, Walton, about Sam Jim Walton, Walton. Sam, Sam Walton, Jim, yeah. Sam and his brother. Yeah, that would be a really interesting movie. Yeah. Um, but, you know, no, I'm, I'm sure there have been scripts written because, you know, they write scripts about everything. My, 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 my younger brother is a script writer. And there are thousands of scripts out there at any one time being evaluated, but they don't choose them. And, and it's there, it's, it's so important. It's not as if it's trivial. You, you and I as, as, um, as, uh, as public intellectuals and so on can yammer as much as we want, but the rubber meets the road in the movies, in rock music and, and so on. And, and it's there that the real cultural, um, cultural isn't quite the word, the, the, the thinking about social justice, if there's such a thing, and, and, and what we should admire comes through. So, so why is it you think that socialism and progressivism and statism more broadly, because it's on the right as well today, Yeah. Why is this opposition to liberalism in the old sense, to, to innovism, to freedom? Well, it's I, so I, prevalent. I think we, we have a sort of, unfortunately, I think we've got a permanent problem. And the problem is that people no longer grow up on farms. <laughs> if you grow up on a farm, uh, you learn about markets and you learn about work. I have friends who, uh, some, a couple of economist friends I can think of, who uh, worked on, uh, who grew up on dairy farms. And if you grew up on a dairy farm, you milk the damn cows t t twice a day, 365 days a year, you learn how to work. But you also learn where milk comes from, so to speak. Not the and supermarket. Not right. the supermarket. Uh, that's that's one thing, and then, then again, in a in a non hierarchical 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 society such as we have, a middle class person grows up in if she grows up in a loving family, she'll discover there are poor people when she's fourteen, and since she's a nice girl, she'll want to bring the poor people into her family. And that model, which is absolutely necessary and good for a family or friends, can't be generalized to even a rather small, large society. Um, uh, Erasmus of uh, Rotterdam began his uh, multiple editions 
of his Latin tags. He had something, by the end he had something, something like 10,000 of them. Always the first one was, among friends, the goods are common. Well, that's right. If I buy a pizza for the party and I come to the party and say, now look, I paid for this, so I'm gonna eat all of it. <laughs> That's friendship destroying, you don't get back. And obviously if you're a child, the rule is from each according to her ability to each according to his need. And that's how it should run. And so th there are these two problems. There's the longer drift away from, um, from farming mm -hmm. and there's this perpetual problem you see, look, in a hierarchical society, such as Shakespeare's London, or for that matter, Jane Austen's Hampshire, um, the, how can I say this? The, the poverty is naturalized. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just seen as natural that there are poor people. And if you're a young woman in such a society, you you, you 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 simply don't worry about it. Whereas in declared egalitarian societies, people are people's imagination when they're fourteen or fifteen, as mine was, is stimulated. When I was, by the time I was fifteen, I was a socialist. There's an old saying: If you're not a socialist by the time you're sixteen, you have no heart. If you're still a socialist by the time you're by the time you're 26, you have no brain. Yep. And I adjust the figures to fit. Absolutely. <laughs> <my little> case. <laughs> I I grew up a socialist. So I, oh, I was, sure. So I, did everybody in Israel was a socialist. There was no nothing else. You didn't know anything else. Uh, I know. And it, it, it it's it's the commonest. Yep. Biography in the modern world in the last hundred years of that move from, from left to liberal, not necessarily from left to church and land conservatism, but from left to free. And uh, that, it, that there are vanishingly few, if I, it's very hard to think of even one who go the other way, yep. uh, says something. <laughs> it says, hmm, maybe all these people who move from left to, to 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 liberal sh are showing that there's something here. <laughs> yeah, you you have a phrase you you call it adultism. Yeah, yeah, that's right, and, and and of course that's the trouble, because the other political philosophies, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, any kind of socialism treats the poor as lovely but pathetic. And any kind of real European style rightism, um, you know, fascism or, or, or uh, monarchy or something, treats the poor as nasty mm -hmm. children. They're either pathetic children or nasty children. And the discovery in liberalism in the 18th century is that you should treat everyone as an adult, as a free adult. And so I am proposing to use this other word. I think it, it'll appeal to, to young people, I hope, adultism. Yep. So where do we go from here? You, you know, so the, the great enrichment has been this amazing success and it's spreading around the world, but it seems like we in the West are turning our backs on it. Yeah. Is, is progress in danger? And, and, and if so, yeah, sure it is. what do if we do it, from it? Well, if you, if you keep reintroducing hierarchies, you keep saying, well, you're free of your husband, but you're not free of the IRS. <laughs> you're, you're not free of the, of, of, uh, of the COVID close downs and so yep. forth. If, if we keep moving saying, well, you aren't really an adult, you're, you're a, a ward of the state, we can reinstitute the kind of nasty hierarchy, calling it nice, but it's usually nasty, that that characterized the world before liberalism. So it's it's dangerous. It's dangerous 
For the economy, it's dangerous for our souls. It's, it's better to be an adult. So we're moving back towards a permission required society? Exactly. That, that word permission, I think, is quite important. I've only realized this in the last few years. We speak of equality of opportunity. That's eh, not quite it. No. Because look, you're smarter than I am, dear. Um, uh, no, I don't, don't argue. I know it. And so how are we going to make you and me equal <laughs> if we want equality of opportunity? We have to drive nails into your head until you're as stupid as I am. I, mean, I, use, I use the Kami Rouge example as, the, as, as how you do it. You yeah. shoot anybody who's a about- Shoot everyone with glasses. In, in Australia, they speak of, of, uh, of cutting down the tall poppies. Absolutely. And, and it's crazy. And in fact, as, uh, as our guy uh, St. Paul said, um, there are varieties of graces. This is in 1 Corinthians 12. And, you know, some people have the, have the, uh, the, 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 the great, uh, does he call them graces? I forget what the Greek is. But anyway, some people have the gift of tongues and some people have the gift of judgment and some people blah, 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 blah. That's great <laughs> that there's such variety. Mm-hmm. So it's not equality of opportunity. That would mean we'd all have to be schmooze, to use a very old cultural reference. We'd all have to be identical. And we, we don't want that. That's stupid. What we do is we're varied, and then we trade with each other. We talk to each other. We play in a jazz band together. Yep. Jazz, by the way, jazz and rock music too, are expressions of liberty and spontaneous cooperation. Um, And that's why they they were um, banned in some ways in the old Soviet Union. Because in the music itself is the idea of equality of uh, permission. That doesn't mean equality to you know, hit someone in the nose. Yep. It means you, 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 you play the drums, she plays the piano, I play the saxophone, and we, we work it out together. Yep. And that's, that's how, that's how our culture works. Mm-hmm. It's how art works, it's how science works. Why would we do anything other in the economy? I mean, what would it be a great idea to have a central planning of the English or um, Hebrew or French or music or central planning yeah, of music? Yeah. How, how does that sound? Central planning of rock music. Does that sound attractive to you? <laughs> Not to me. <laughs> Humanity. Um, in that sense, yeah. I mean, the would the egalitarianism we talk about is is a political egalitarianism. It's egalitarianism of rights. Uh, and not right. an economic egalitarianism. That's right. Although, although, I, although I ha- you have to be careful with the word rights because people sure. use it today yep. all over the place. You have the right to a apartment in downtown Chicago. No, you don't. You, don't. you have permission to buy to rent or buy an apartment in downtown Chicago. You have permission. So, and and it's the absence of permissions that are the problem. It's the war on drugs, the, uh, the I don't know, the, the, the very existence of borders, the absurdity that I can't buy from France or, or Canada or Mexico anytime I want is very, you know, very irritating. It's not just irritating, it's bad for us. We should be able to, you know, go where we want, trade where we want, invent where we want. And when we do, it turns out it didn't have to be this way. There's no theorem that shows it, but it turned out empirically that it was tremendously enriching, both physically and culturally. Mm-hmm. There is a kind of underlying conservative claim that you'll hear a lot that, well, yeah, we've gotten rich, but we've lost our soul. We aren't all Catholics as we, as we once were, or Orthodox Jews, and this is a terrible thing. We, we, we have to go back to those days. And there are a lot of people saying this now. Yep. So uh, the one place where we still have 
this innovism or innovation at least and 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 striving for the future silicon valley and yeah. yet they have this these horrible ideas at the same time <laughs> yeah, they do. how do you how do you see that resolving itself well, Is, are the ideas going to kill the valley in the end that's the trouble it's not just the valley it's it's it, it's it's engineers and scientists in general they know bugger all about economics they think they do if they're successful in business they're sure they do um <laughs> and they haven't ever thought about the economy from as it were the eighth floor as you, you and i do um they're down in the in the down on the ground floor, which is fine, that's good. And they're making deals and thinking up new ways of, of ma ma making computers and so on, it's great. But they then presume that they know these sort of philosophical concepts like the impossibility of planning a large economy or a small, you know, look, when people say, oh, we can plan the economy. I say, how well has your life been planned, dear? And they say, oh, well, geez, not too well. I mean, I made a few mistakes. <laughs> okay, now multiply that by billions and you've got an idea of how, uh, how foolish it is to intervene in this system. You're and, imposing your mistakes on everybody. Not You're not the only one to that's suffer. Right. That's right. You know, for, for example, physical and biological scientists believe that there's overpopulation. You'll hear it all the time. Yep. Um, go to the discussion sections of reprints on Amazon of Ehrlich's famous book of 1968, The Population Explosion. And you'll find these engineers and scientists saying, oh, well, it's true it didn't, he said that by the 1990s, civilization would end and we'd all be all be killing each other over scarcities of food. Didn't happen. But they say, well, it, it, it'll eventually happen. And they're, and they're all Malthusians. You'll say, you know, Malthus was a very great economist. And in 1798, he wrote this very interesting book, which was true about all previous history. <laughs> And since 1798, it's gotten to be a worse and worse describer of the world. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, no, eventually it'll be true. So and then they use, you know, they use crazy arguments like the second law of thermodynamics and all that to, to intervene in economic discussions or historical discussions about which they know nothing. I just had a debate with a journalist um, in the English magazine Prospect, um, a, a science journalist, and he has, has the same kind of attitudes. And, and you know, he's not a fool, no. he knows a lot about science, but he doesn't know anything about economics. Why is the, why do you think the, this zero-sum mentality, which Malthus and, and, and I think uh, population explosion all reflect. Why is that so dominant in, 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 in the world in which we live, where it's obvious? Yeah, I know. I know. I know. Well, it's, it's partly, as we both know, that people dismiss or are ignorant of the history. I mean, if for, first they're ignorant of it. Yeah. And you say, look, since 1800, income per head has increased in many, many countries, including very poor ones, by a factor of 30 or 100 per capita. They say, well, yeah, yeah, but who cares about that? What I'm concerned about is what's gonna happen next year. Yep. I say, well, look, uh, yeah, so it's hard to get people out of that mentality because at any one time, it's true. You know, obviously if I could get, if I could go and rob Bill Gates um, or, um, or uh, what's his name, um, Jeff, Bezos. Je Jeff Bezos, if I could take a 38 and say, okay, Jeff Bezos, I need $100 million, that would make me better off. It's perfectly plain. But of course, if we make a habit of this, we don't get Jeff Bezos's. Not so much 
because he's got some incentive to earn another million dollars. That's always been a kind of a silly argument, but because the economy is signaling through his success that you need more of these reinventions mm -hmm. of ma mail order department stores, more reinventions of Sears Roebuck and Montgomery Ward, such as he did. So the one thing that it is it makes me optimistic about the future because I think we're both optimistic in the end, in spite yeah. of in spite of all this, is that we live today in a world that is so interconnected. So yes, the barriers to entry of all kinds there are you, yeah. you, see, you know immigration certainly is a barrier and there are barriers to goods to some extent. Uh, but there's no barrier in most places for information. That yeah, is, that's right. We are connected through the internet in a way that humanity has never been connected before. And that's crucial, dear. I, I think you're absolutely right because of the demonstration effect. People in India know that it's possible to be as rich as the United States because they see it on their Indian local TV. They see some guy in, in uh, Mumbai doing really well. I think, hey, I wonder, I think I could do that. And, and if, if, if they're closed in their villages and there's no TV or anything, all I can see is the next door neighbor. And again, you get back to the, the zero sum situation. Ah, I got to steal from him because that's the only way I get rich. Whereas it, it, you look, um, as you pointed out earlier, places like Hong Kong and Taiwan or Ireland or lots of others, and now China and India and anyway, the United States and Finland and Japan have demonstrated that you can go from poverty to well to do um, uh, Botswana yeah. in, in South Africa is a yeah. great success of this character. Okay. You can't keep that bottled up. You, you can't keep that genie in the bottle. No. And as you say, it's the information genie yep. that gets out and puts ideas into people's head, the idea of equal permission. So, so, it, it, so it's, I, I think of it also in another dimension. That is, if ideas build on one another, right? Yeah. And that's how progress happens in innovation. Yeah. On top. Now, we're exposed to innovators, like 8 billion of us, right? And, That's and right. People in sub Saharan Africa through the internet are exposed to ideas. That's exactly right. New ideas. Well, that's why, that's another of the many reasons why Malthusianism is wrong. These days, you and I, I think, agree, an extra person on the planet is not even just another opportunity for trade, which is certainly true, but is another opportunity for someone with a bright idea. Absolutely. And, and if you look back into the history of technology or of, of organizational innovations or of biological innovations, um, or if just ordinary people taking a chance, my grandfather was an electrical contractor. He went bankrupt in the, in the Great Depression because his bank failed. And then he became a well-to-do um, contractor and his son, my uncle, did very well. So, if if you if you see how it actually works, it's hard to deny it. Yet, <laughs> the, yet they try. The Communist Party of China keeps trying, yep. keeps trying to get the genie back in the bottle, close off the great wall of China um, electronically and so forth. So I want to be sensitive to your time. So let's make this, ask you the, the, this final question. So, so what do we do, right? So, so there's all this positive stuff going on in the world. Yeah. And we, we, I think, share a vision for what is potentially possible, what, sure. what could happen. Sure. How do we get from where we are today? And we both agree that the, of the role of ideas. It's about ideas. How do we get yeah. from where we are today to that potential that I think? Well, well, we have to avoid shooting ourselves in the foot as you Europeans massively did in August 1914. I mean, actual yes. um, uh, shooting wars. 
Um, we have to um, keep arguing against statisms of various kinds. I, I look, it changed once. Mm -hmm. In the 18th century, liberalism was thought to be completely nuts. And yet it became a dominant ideology with very large social consequences for a long time. Then around 1900, maybe somewhat earlier, it started to shift the other way. And now we're in the age of, um, uh, of statism, which keeps being reinforced by accidents, such as the wars. Go governments are, whether they're competent at it or not, that's their main job is wars. Um, and then it's central planning, wartime socialism, um, wartime socialism, and then the Great Depression, and then this, and then that, and now COVID is another yep, yep. Um, sort of uh, occasion for statism to advance its agenda, even innocently, thinking, oh, God, we got to do something about this. So it, it um, one thing I, th you know, I don't know, we, you and I, have to keep writing books, keep trying to get people to understand this or to uh, uh, be committed to it emotionally. Mm -hmm. I, as I said, I think it's the artists, the, the, the popular artists who are probably more important than us. But if we can convince a bunch of uh, good novelists, yep. this will do, we'll do fine. But it's, it's an ongoing job because look how attractive um, sort of fascist populism is temporarily or, or le left-wing populism as in Venezuela. It just keeps being, you know, and then of course, <laughs> I, I think it's worth pointing out that the fact that Putin and Xi and so forth and, and um, Maduro have to use the police to force their people mm -hmm. to stop saying liberal things may not be a sign of strength yep. <laughs> in the long run. I think that's right. I think in the long run, we win because we're right. And, yeah. uh, and, yeah. and all ideas, the ideas are consistent with, with human life. And, and They are. In fact, there, I, you know, I, I, there, there is an argument you can make, and I, I'd like to know more about it to be able to do it better. But you can make the case that hunter-gatherer bands, which after all is our deep inheritance genetically, were highly egalitarian and highly enterprising. Mm -hmm. They weren't centrally planned. They were very small, 15 or 20 people. And they'd wander around the Red Sea or something. And, and that, that was it. That, that's, and there were thousands of them. And so we have this genetic predisposition not to hierarchy. Now, apparently, we also have hierarchy in our blood. But hierarchy was established mainly through agriculture. And I think there's a there's a genetic predisposition that we might be able to take it that we do I think take advantage of in thinking of ourselves as liberated um, adults. And obviously, it, it's ideas that trigger it in one way or the other. So that's uh, right. That's we have to right. Keep up the battle of ideas. So thank you, Deirdre, for doing this. Uh, thank well, thank you. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Good. So have I. And and thank you for. I, I, your lifelong fight for, for these ideas. And, <laughs> Thank uh, you, dear. Well, the same to you. We're on the same side of this so-called yeah. uh, debate. Wonderful. Stay well. And sure. I would love to see you somewhere in the world. <laughs> I hope so. Cheerio, dearie. Bye. Bye-bye.